نمبر نمبر 9 ولا 8 اتس نيد تو انفست ان ذا لوكال هيومن ريسورسز That's under no, our, one of our asks under localization. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, all, all this came from discussion yesterday. Uh -huh. uh, number uh, eight, uh, 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 development and uh, uh, local market, uh, invest, investment in local market. Uh, I had something is uh, uh, the strategy should be uh, short term and long term. We we'll have to mix mm -hmm. both of them together. Uh, yes, yes, that's in our ask to, as well. Uh, number, number 10 is what is our priorities, actually. Uh, number uh, 10 is maybe supporting the governance issue. Uh, yeah, okay. The, uh, number yeah. Uh, uh, 11 or 10, uh, it is the, the salaries of the local staff and even the cost uh, of supporting uh, the local uh, voluntary teams. Uh, oh, I'll back. have a lot to talk. I'll have a lot to talk about with our donors on that one. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, number five. No, number no, the last one, which actually came from Hassan to conclude, were very good operators, very good. Uh, what not undertaker? What uh, contractors? Actually, we become very good operators and very good contractors. And I asked, and they added on this yesterday that we became also very good. Uh, Beggars, <laughs> and we, 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 we changed it. We changed the the, the active and the empowered uh, Syrian women and families into begging families. Unfortunately, because the, the dependency syndrome, we, mm -hmm. are, we, yeah. we created the dependency syndrome. Child, and it's uh, yeah, I mean, the the past few years when we tried to end it, it yeah. all came back again after this earthquake. Unfortunately, uh, because since mm -hmm. uh, twenty sixteen. I've been saying no more food basket, no more food basket. Ah. But actually, the, the Arab culture sometimes, even the international donors, are insisting on the food basket. I think now we, I don't know what time is now. We can start in one or two minutes, Sister Fatima. Yes, inshallah. Let's start in two minutes, inshallah. And yeah. thank you very much for those who joined on time. Uh, really appreciate it. We will start very soon. Two more minutes, please. Yeah. Thank you. So for, for the people who joined in time, I was just uh, briefing uh, uh, Sister Marwa about the Arabic meeting yesterday, which some of the outcomes of the discussion, uh, which uh, was very well attended by a lot of Syrian organizations from inside Syria and from uh, Turkey and from different uh, countries as well. And uh, uh, this is something which actually Marwa and I We'll be discussing with you and to see what the, are the gaps. Uh, Alhamdulillah, yani, <coughs> this initiative has taken place yani, last month and we're still working on it. So be yani, patient with us for the coming to uh, three minutes, inshallah. Thank you. We can start, Sister Fatma, if you are ready. Okay, Bismillah. Thank you for everyone uh, who joined us today. Can you uh, share the screen? Yeah, I will share the screen, Dr. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, this meeting is for, you know, it's, it's for a collection for organizations who are, who support and who, who, who are here to support and care about the Syrian humanitarian uh, cause. 
Uh, as you know, the Syrian crisis is considered one of the most complex crises since the World War II, uh, due to its severity and duration. And then came the earthquakes in February, and, and a new crisis was born inside the crisis that was existing in, in there. We all know that it's uh, the, the earthquake and this very long crisis have impacted the lives of millions of people. Many people have lost their lives, they lost, lost their homes, they lost their livelihood. And that happens finally during a severe cold and, you know, um, snow, snowfalls and very cold weather conditions. Of course, we know the many negative effects that it has on the infrastructure and in the economy, not only not only in Syria, inside Syria, but also in southern eastern Turkey, which was naturally the supplying lung for humanitarian and humanitarian needs for northern west Syria. Uh, soon we will go through the presentation so you will know exactly what are why we are here, what we are trying to do. We are trying to just a group of organizations coming together, trying to find a solution, a way forward. Try to look at the, exactly what are the lessons learned over the last 10 years or 11 years. Uh, try to bring together uh, key, uh, you know, uh, key people, uh, key parties to address some of the post-conflict and the post-earthquake uh, recovery issues, as well as try to develop a set of recommendations for how do we better support the Syrian, uh, Syrians everywhere, and specifically the Syrian NGOs. So thank you for coming again. And uh, I will share my screen. So we start the, the presentation for today. Um, if I may ask, and if no one has any problems with it, I see that we have um, a handful of people. Would it be okay if we just have a round of introductions? Would that be okay? Is that, yes? Is it okay with everyone? Yes, you... that's fine, Mama. Ah, okay, great, yes, thanks. Sure. Max, would you like to start first then? Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Max Wahid, and I look after the finances in WAF. And uh, uh, I was uh, hoping to join the meeting yesterday, but today's uh, hopefully should be also very interesting. Great. Welcome very to nice. everybody as well. <laughs> very nice to meet you. Um, and who's next? Taha? Yeah, I can be next. Uh, I'm from Turkey's. Uh, I'm from Turkey, Doctors Worldwide Turkey, a programs and operations manager. Uh, since the beginning of the earthquake, we have been uh, six provinces, both Turkey and Syria, and we are supporting our uh, any kind of uh, earthquake victims right now. Uh, we we were on the field uh, and we ju we just just arrived from the field. And it was devastating for the uh, entire cities are collapsed and the humanitarian aid needs to be supported on those areas, as you mentioned before. Uh, that's it. But by the way, four of in here in this meeting is from Doctors Worldwide Turkey, <laughs> Jalalitin Ahmed Jaydan and Sofia, also Doctors Worldwide Turkey. <laughs> awesome. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Super. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sufyan Turk. I'm from Dr. Zorda, Turkey. I'm working as a project coordinator. Thank you so much. Oh, very nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. This is Ahmed Fatih. Again, from Dr. Zorda, Turkey. Uh, I was uh, in hot. I, I stayed there 20, 20, 20 days. Oh. And I had a field visit uh, uh, for the Syria. I saw the effect of uh, the devastating effect of the earthquake in, in Jindaras, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, I stayed there, there one, uh, a week. Uh, as the sister uh, Fatima, I guess. Uh, said many people stayed homeless, living now in a tent. Uh, on uh, the conditions, the conditions are not hygienic. Uh, they need uh, health care. They need, they need everything. The need in the field is limitless. By the way, mm -hmm. uh, they are already in a living in a war area. Uh, the the earthquake 
uh, the increased uh, need in, in, in the field. So uh, I, I, if, if, if needed, I can share my exper experiences during the presentation, inshallah. I am... Uh, I, I, I got... Uh, I, 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 I did a, a service map, uh, especially related to health. Oh, I mean, uh, I I visited uh, IDA Independent Doctors Association. I visited SRD's uh, health center. I visited MDM, mm -hmm. and I talked with the uh, health authorities uh, in our field. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can contribute. Uh, I hope a lot in this presentation. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you very much. Oh, looking forward to it because. Um, health is one of the sectors that I am the weakest in. <laughs> since, since, since the organization that I'm, I'll introduce myself right now, but let's just first finish everyone. Has everyone introduced themselves? Jalalati also is, or maybe not. Okay. Oh, then in that, ah, there's Jalalati. Super. <laughs> I love it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. This is Jalal Tin from Doctors Worldwide, Turkey. I'm also uh, I'm working here as a project coordinator. Thank yeah. you for give, giving me this chance. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So. I'll introduce myself. Okay, so I'm Marwa, Yada, or you can say Marve, Turkçe. <laughs> anyway, merhaba uh, arkadaşlar. I've I've actually been living in Turkey, believe it or not. On the fourth of Dort Nisan will be on doku sene burdayım. Anyway, so I'm practically a Turk. <laughs> anyway. So um I'm Marwa. I am the DPDM at Tekef the Shem. Um, TAS has been working in both Syria and Turkey um, since its registration in, in Turkey in 2013. Uh, we have a large refugee response, um, which has um, expanded greatly uh, since 2015. We, of course, um, have been working in Northwest Syria since um, 2011 in the onset of the war itself. I am personally uh, one of the non-Syrians that are working in a Syrian NGO. I am very proud of that, of course. Uh, I, I'm an honorary Syrian, they call me. Uh, my other hat, I have another hat, uh, besides being the DPDM at Tekef al Um, My other hat is that I am a part of the Northwest Syria NGO Forum. I am in the steering committee, as well as I am leading on the advocacy working group. Um, so maybe you may have heard my name before or have seen some of my emails in the mailing list. Um, and so um, I'm very happy to be here today. I'm also part of the coalition here, the Humanitarian Coalition for Syria. And yeah, it, the reason why I say I don't have much health experience, so I'm glad that you guys are here, is because TAS, the Kefil Hashem, or TAS, uh, to make it easier, is um, works in all the sectors except health. <laughs> so your inputs will be very yani, valued, extremely valued. So yeah, let us start. I think with the looks of it, we're going to have a very good discussion. Uh, definitely after after this presentation. So uh, ready for it? Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Over to you. Okay, I will. I will also introduce myself after everyone else, and then I will do that after Dr. Hani Banna. Dr. Hani, you want to introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Hani Banna. I've been uh, with WAF for the last uh, maybe ten years. Uh, I was pre previously the the working for Islamic Leaf for about 25 years. And people know me as Islamic Leaf uh, worldwide. And now I moved out from the humanitarian response and development into advocacy, research, and uh, 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 what do you call it? Advocacy and research and uh, 
support to the local organizations. Thank you, Dr. Hani. I am Fatima, um, International Programs uh, Coordinator at WAF, World Humanitarian Action Forum. Uh, so I think we'll just continue, we'll start with the presentation. So we just have more time for us to hear each other and to exchange our knowledge and experiences and try to put you know, some sort of an action plan or a way forward based on the data or what's happening in, in, you know, in the ground. Um, okay, so as, as, uh, as Marwa said, we are the Humanitarian Coalition for Syria. What is this coalition? What's the story behind it? And are we a new platform? Are we a new network? Are we a unique new organization? Um, I think we'll start by defining what is this group of people is doing or who are we? Uh, Dr. Hani, if you may, please answer uh, this question. Assalamu uh, alaikum. It is a group that has been created, a temporary group, not a permanent one. Uh, before and after my visit to uh, Antakya. My visit to Antakya was on the 14th of February last month. And uh, we had two meetings, two coordination meetings. One was on the 12th of uh, February in Istanbul. The second one was on the 14th, uh, on the 18th of February in Istanbul. And out of these two meetings, we produced uh, a statement which has been signed by 139 organizations. I think Fatma will, will show you the result of all these people who signed it. And this is the second uh, document that actually has been signed by, or has been filled by uh, 40 organizations today uh, to, uh, to decide where they are working and uh, how they are working geographical location and the, the gaps and uh, the number of beneficiaries and, 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 and. We did not call uh, ourselves a permanent group because of the sensitivity, just because too many coordination group uh, been organized by the Syrian organization and others. We called ourselves a new name, which is Humanitarian Coalition for Syria. It is a temporary name for temporary group to take the lead of uh, this process till the end of this year. And we hope at the end of the year, we'll have an international conference, most probably in Istanbul. Actually, at the, at the beginning, at the end of uh, November or beginning of December, to see what is the outcome and the way forward. Uh, so far, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, I I'm not going to describe to you the the the, the the extent of damage which I have seen in uh, in Antakya, uh, I visited Antakya many times in the past. But what I have seen in, on uh, 14th of February was incredible. It is reminding me of tsunami of 2004-2005 in Banda Aceh in Indonesia, tsunami in actually Sri Lanka. Uh, which uh, the tsunami wave hit uh, Banda Aceh in Indonesia, then it traveled to, uh, it killed about 250,000 people in Indonesia, then it went straight to uh, Sri Lanka to kill about 50,000 people, and it reached uh, Somalia to kill about 30 people on the shore of the ocean at the so what I what I've seen and most of you have seen in different parts of Turkey, uh, as actually unfortunately, uh, the scene which uh, reminds us of the Second World War, or tsunami, or maybe the Day of Judgment. Unfortunately, uh, my uh, worry actually is for Syria inside because there's no solid and strong government. Uh, while Alhamdulillah, we have a government or in Turkey who is able to control the access and uh, control the volunteers who are going here and there and distribution of data and distribution of aid material while in Syria inside, very weak government, very weak infrastructure, and unfortunately, very weak civil society organization. So there's actually disparity between Turkey, which has been badly affected about uh, the square area of about more than 1,000 
square miles, about 15 million people affected by the earthquake. Uh, uh, it is, is badly affecting the economy of Turkey, especially in the, this area, which constitutes about 10 or 11 percent of the national economy of Turkey. And uh, my estimate, when we published it uh, last month, about three or four weeks ago, was the damage in Turkey might reach 100 billion euro and more, and the economical loss might reach the same figure again. So really, uh, but I, I believe that the Turkish government and their friends and his friends will be very able to uh, support uh, a government while inside Syria, it is the situation is not the same. Back to you, Fatima. OK, thank you, Dr. Hani. Uh, so as Dr. Hani mentioned, uh, as a way of responding to the earthquake disaster, uh, WAF and a group of partners have issued a statement. This statement was mainly based on the, the outcomes and recommendations that came out from two coordinating meetings. Uh, the statement so far uh, was calling you know, commitments to actions, had a key asks, uh, has been so far signed by 139 organizations from different countries of the world, but of course, mainly from Syria and Turkey. And uh, it was both in English and in Arabic. So now Marwa will go through the statement, what were the main key asks, and you know, just give you a quick summary of, uh, of the statement. So Marwa. Okay. Um, could you flip the slide? Mm -hmm. Please, thank you. Um, so just very briefly, um, there were four main components to the key asks, uh, one of which was basically the lessons learned that we all experienced, um, every one of us, uh, even in this call, um, was very much around duty of care. Now, as we all know, the duty of care has been one of those buzzwords in the humanitarian sector, especially for those working in Turkey, in Turkey and in Northwest Syria. Um, yes, signatories have signed on from 2019, promising that they would support duty of care. However, what we have learned is that although they've signed on it, not one donor has easily accepted to cover duty of care for all the victims, for all the people that were affected by this disaster. So a lessons learned definitely from this earthquake was the duty of care and the lack of duty of care and acceptance by the donor community. A, the other major points, as you can imagine, especially those that are here in Turkey, was the disaster risk reduction, the early warning systems, the lack of disaster response and preparedness. Now, I'm not just saying that this is for Turkey, it's also for Northwest Syria. This is a disaster that none of us expected, that none of us had experienced in this part of the world. So this is something that came up as a definite need moving forward. The National System for Data Collection, as many of our Turkish colleagues on the line now are aware that here in Turkey, um, the, the data collection, especially when it comes to the national system, when it comes to disasters, is not as strong as it should be. And this was proof of that. Afad has done an amazing job. Uh, the Turkish government has deployed as much as they possibly could. However, let's keep in mind that the search and rescue teams is one thing, but then the data collection is in another. And as many of you have experienced, including myself, um, speaking with my TAS hat, is that we had lost one of our colleagues from the HQ, um, Betul. Uh, she was with her family in um, Hatay at the time. Uh, Betul, may she rest in peace. She and three of her sisters and four of her cousins had all died when the building collapsed in Hatay. She was working in our early recovery department in the HQ in Gaziantep, but went home to see her family um, for the weekend. 
and we did not learn about her loss until one and a half weeks later. Um, and of course, you know, telling her family is the worst thing. How can you tell parents that your daughter has passed or that your four daughters have passed? Um, so yeah, we need to have a proper data collection. Um, moving on to coordination. It, obviously there needs to be, what we came out from the two meetings that were held here in Istanbul, is that a national body to support the NGOs in particular needs to be created and just created for emergencies. Now, let us keep in mind, and we are all aware together, that uh, the government of Turkey has done more than we had ever imagined, has pushed heavily to support NGOs, has even opened the doors and um, published a decree um, allowing more international NGO support to come and work uh, in this response, okay, to support the current NGOs. So I think, or we think that definitely um, a national body needs to be created just for this. A Syrian liaison to coordinate with the government of Turkey. Um, as we know, uh, Turkey is the number one country in the world that has taken in the largest number of Syrian refugees. With that being said, you know, the Turkish government has already started to ensure that there are Syrian representatives or liaisons in many of the institutions to support, especially for those that need the language ability or to support in providing uh, language assistance. Um, However, when it comes to disasters like this, the need to have also a Syrian liaison who is affected, who knows the effect both inside of Syria as well as Turkey, as they are very much interconnected, is definitely needed. Uh, in addition to all of these, there's also the sharing and exchanging of information, um, especially when it comes to technical um, information. Now, this needs to be a platform, some sort of, you know, online assistance or some sort of system needs to be in place in order for technical information and exchange to be met, to be handled, to be dealt with so that we are able to access it. You know, just like we currently have here in Turkey under the NGO community, we have the UNHCR system, the UNDP system under the different working groups. We need to also have one when it comes to disasters. Uh, we are aware that currently uh, UNDAC uh, is um, set up here, but of course, set up quite late. So now just, you know, collecting data last minute and technical expertise have been deployed to come. How about if we have it in place? Uh, formation of a working group to follow up on the progress. Now, of course, we are currently now you know, dealing with several things at one time. So how about if we try to create one working group that can actually follow up on what's happening with the data collection system, what's happening with the government and its disaster response and preparedness, you know, uh, systems, warning systems, uh, making sure that, you know, the earthquake codes are being met, the standards are being put in place. We need that follow-up team. If we can have that to ensure that the steps that we want to be mitigated for any potential future issues is put in place, this is a good step. So having that working group to work with the government, to work with the different entities, you know, would be of um, benefit. Of course, when it comes to funding and advocacy, the two top ones that we are all involved in, obviously um, the need, the dire need for both short-term and long-term support and funding is absolutely critical. We will go into further discussion, of course, later on about the lack of funding that has been given, the delays in funding that we have seen. This is the disaster of a century. 
And why are we still six weeks into it, waiting for funding to come? This is unacceptable on all levels, as we, as we all, I'm sure, agree on. Now, we also need to look ahead. Longer-term funding, multi-year programming is something that we need to start pushing for. Yeah, disaster recovery efforts, allocation towards this is a must. Allocation towards dignified shelter settlements is a must. As we know here in Turkey, the government has supported the relocation efforts of people, of those that have been affected into makeshift houses, into shelters, into camps. But obviously the same thing that's happening in Syria, putting families into camps is the number one breaking violation of dignity. Yes, short term, we have to do it. But for a long term, it cannot go on like this. And then the final thing that we need to focus when it comes to funding in particular is the psychological support. We have all been affected to some degree on a psychological level. Yeah, we all work in humanitarian sector. So our threshold to take on, to keep taking on, to keep on going is very high. However, we forget about the mental side of things, the psychological side of things. We are always looking at tangible material, but no, the worst and the, let's say, the, the hidden is psychological. And if we are not in our right state of mind, this can have extreme long-term negative effects on people. I will give you just a small example. As we know, the Syrians who have fled the war in Syria, came to Turkey seeking refuge, seeking safety, seeking security. They found it here in Turkey. 10 years later, many of them have gotten married, had children, their children are in school. They thought that they got their white picket fence, the American dream, quote unquote, or let's call it the Turkish dream. Unfortunately, with this earthquake, they have been re-traumatized again. This is for the Syrian refugees. Now let's look at the Turkish, the host community itself. We have not experienced something like this except over a decade ago in Kojeli. And we haven't learned from that. So now the location is in Southeast Turkey and it's worse than ever. So psychological support needs to be focused on and funding allocated to that. Advocacy. Without advocacy, nothing can go on. Nothing can happen. Dr. Henny himself left the humanitarian and development field to focus on advocacy, advocacy under the humanitarian world. But the point is, is that without advocacy, our voices cannot be heard. Our needs cannot be met. The, the issues cannot be addressed. And we need to stand true to what donors have signed on to what the signatories have signed on. And many of those have been on the grand bargain. We can discuss the grand bargain later if you'd like. Grand bargain is focusing on localization, okay? And unfortunately, the local actors are the ones that are the first responders, but the least supported, the least supported by the international community. A focusing on the resolution, let's not forget, with this earthquake, people are forgetting, they are being distracted with the UN Security Council resolution. Talks are, they've gone on radio silence regarding that. So we need to keep it still on the table. We need to keep it in the agenda of the international actors, of those politicians. We need to also, advocate for early recovery. We have to still go back and advocate of what we were doing five years ago. We need to go back and start from scratch to advocate for the necessity of a recovery phase. And finally, fast tracking of funds. As I mentioned earlier, it is a shame and a dire and extreme shame on the humanitarian community on the international actors that 
six weeks into the worst disaster of the century and funds have not come in as they should. So these are just some of the points, some of the key asks that came out of the two meetings. Of course, we can discuss these afterwards, but if anyone has any questions, happy to answer them now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mar uh, Marwa. Yes, and the door is open for questions, comments, and feedback. As you have said, these were the main key asks that came out from two coordinating meetings that were directly uh, organized by WAF and a group of partners in Istanbul as a response to the earthquake. The first meeting was on the 12th of February, and the second was on the 18th of February. Uh, in, in total, around 30 or more uh, local Syrian organizations, national, international organizations have attended these meetings, and these were the main asks. They were sent in a statement on the 3rd of March, uh, so far signed by 138 organizations, and just would like to say that the statement still open. The link is still open for you know to be shared and to to be endorsed and to be you know shared and endorsed by more organizations. Um, something else that we have sent and shared with everyone, or shall I just shall I wait first for feedback, questions, or comments uh, before we move to the next statement that or uh, survey that we have sent. Uh, yes, I, I do have a quest, two questions for Marwa, if I may. Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marwa. That was very interesting talk that you just uh, presented. Uh, unfortunately, uh, dire uh, consequences and dire stories. And I'm so sorry about one of your colleagues passing away as well. My questions, I have two questions. Number one, do we know the, the, the whole budget of what is required uh, from the international community and how much in aid has been received to date as well so that we can compare how much was needed and how much uh, uh, has actually come in. And number two, uh, if I may ask, uh, what are the estimate number of people that have passed away in this earthquake together both in Syria as well as in Turkey? Thank you. Okay, uh, very valid questions, Max. And uh, to be very frank with you, uh, the numbers, the numbers are not accurate. Hence, why these are lessons learned. Yeah, uh, the numbers are not accurate, but we are looking at up to fifty thousand that have passed. Oh. Yeah. And of course, over 150,000, if I'm not mistaken, uh, injured. So we're talking huge numbers. Are they accurate? You know, of course, there is no uh, proper data collection that's being done. So we have to rely on the numbers that are being shared with us. Yeah. Uh, that's for the, the, the second question. For the first question, we will share um, in the coming slides a sample. Again, to keep you in the loop and for our other colleagues is that unfortunately due to, let's, I, I'll be again very frank, um, political reasons I would say, the UN agencies are not providing the accurate data uh, the humanitarian community, the NGO community itself, is providing data from the first responders, those on the ground, based on their needs assessments, and collecting these numbers and trying to tally them accordingly. In the coming slides, uh, because of the lack of accurate numbers and data, we have taken a sample of, uh, yes, 41 organizations that we have gathered information from. And these organizations are national organizations, so they are the ones on the ground. So this sample is just to give you an idea of what is needed, what has been received, and 
based on our uh, judgment, based on, sorry, many of the needs assessments that we have reviewed, our request is for 1 billion, 1 billion to cover the needs. We have divided them up into phases and this is what we will discuss in a minute. Yeah. Local NGOs are not registered to you in data set. We can question the accuracy of the data shared. Um, for local NGOs are not registered to you in data set, we can question the accuracy of the data shared by the UN NGOs. Totally agreed, Ahmed. Um, keeping in mind that local NGOs are expected to provide their data, their information, if it's for Turkey, as you know, it's to the working groups. So UNHCR, UNDP, the Livelihood Working Group or Protection Working Group or Education. So they are expected to provide that to them in which then the UN agencies would provide, um, you know, um, a, a tallied, sorry, or something went to my head, um, a tallied um, data set to provide. Again, for those in Northwest Syria, as we know, there are the clusters. And with the clusters, again, they do collect from all their members, the data. But I agree with you, Ahmed, that again, the accuracy of the data shared by UN agencies, I personally do not rely on them. <laughs> yeah, and he's speaking on behalf of the NGO forum and also leading on the contingency planning task force for the NGO forum, I have been directly involved with trying to gather accurate data from the clusters for Northwest Syria. And let me tell you, it's one of the hardest tasks I have ever had in my life, <laughs> in my 46 years of being alive on this earth. Yes, so I agree with you, Ahmed. I totally agree. Uh, let me expand my uh, uh, idea because the UN agencies uh, insist on the, 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 the format. Okay, they have um, strict procedures, uh, strict, uh, how can I say, rules for it. Okay, that's why they are, uh, this, uh, uh, th th this thing is keeping them to be registered to UN de 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 uh, agencies, uh, uh, if I am uh, right. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, they are, uh, this is not about uh, just data set, they are also instituting some trainings. And these trainings are, they think that lo the local NGOs thinking that they are uh, not fit to their tradition. Uh, they are their, their, their values. That's, yes. that's why they are abstaining themselves to be part of UN uh, action uh, in, mm -hmm. the, in the field. This is my observation. And we will, and we will discuss how, how active the UN has been since this has happened, right? How active, <laughs> quote unquote. I, so, didn't see any, I didn't see any UN agencies in, in, in the field, in genders. This is my observation. Okay, so it seemed like we have... A I don't see tents. Field, field <laughs> tents, that's, that's all. UNHCR tents, that's all. Yes, there's nobody, like, <laughs> only tents. You can see yeah, the tents. Well, some, some, somehow they uh, give the tents, but there's no authorized person or responsibles or response... There's nobody. Agree, Taha. Yes, yeah. The UN, uh, till today, so I am in talks with um, the regional offices, the HQs in the UN, um, in, in, sorry, in New York, with the UN agencies, their humanitarian advisors, as well as even we had a meeting with Martin Griffiths himself, um, with Reda, um, his deputy, and... To be honest, it's been a disgrace. As we all know, the UN um, has been the last to respond, to respond, sorry. They, um, which of course is the double standard because you'd assume that the UN are the first to respond. Unfortunately, they have been the last to respond. The UN till today, six weeks into the earthquake, has not provided one 
cent, one karush, one lira, nothing towards duty of care until today. However, let me show you what the UN has done with their staff in Gaziantep. They have happily relocated them all to a very nice, safe location in another city, fully paid for, fully covered within the first few days of the earthquake. However, they cannot release any duty of care to any of their partners until they have officially standardized and agreed on a specific amount to give for duty of care. Can you imagine after six weeks? Yeah. And so it's, it's really shameful. Um, the question that, what are your thoughts on UN agency collecting? Uh, no, 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 you can ask the question if you like. The what, sorry, Fatma? I say Munawara, she can ask the question if she likes to talk and ask the question verbally instead of writing. If you like Munawara. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I'm no problem. Happy to, to ask the question. Um, my main question was um, what your thoughts are on UN agencies who are collecting large amounts of money for the earthquake, but we're not seeing it on the ground. But I asked that question whilst you had already started answering it and my brother Ahmed has also elaborated on, on it as well. Um, so perhaps the answer has already been um, I, given, but feel free to, if you feel, feel you'd like to elaborate further. Okay, that actually I can also add to it, um, is that as you know, um, the UN OCHA is the pooled fund for Northwest Syria. And until today, today is the 17th of March, uh, they will be releasing, releasing the reserve allocation to the partners that have been pre-selected. Um, the disbursement will start as of next week. Can you imagine? And let me give you an idea also about the funds, is that they have, um, as, as you all are aware, Martin Griffiths have signed on was it $40 million to be released through SERF, the SERF fund, which should automatically go to the UN agencies, correct? Now, eh, don't get fooled by what is written uh, in the papers and you know all over the news. Yes, he signed off for the 40 million. 30 million of that was covered through a loan the 30 million was borrowed by UN OCHA to be able to release the reserve allocation for next week. So as you can see, uh, the UN agencies have not actually released funds for any of their partners, A UNICEF, has just recently sent um, published a call saying that they have $7 million that will go towards education. However, $7 million for the whole of Syria, not Northwest. This is for the whole of Syria. How the allocation or let's say division of the, the funds will be is unknown. Uh, when we are looking at WSP, for example, so TAS, I'll give you an example about TAS. We are their strategic partner, one of their strategic, well, they, we are their strategic partner, and also for UNICEF for education, TAS is as well. So we have only received a top up, a top up, and not a significant amount as an FYI in, um, in both. Um, IOM has been active in trying to support in distribution. However, again, for the size of this disaster, it, it's not even, you know, you, you can't even compare it. It is very, very, very minimal. Um, I cannot speak uh, about WHO, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I don't have too much involvement in the health sector. That's a colleague of mine that would um, for on behalf of the NGO forum. 
So I'm speaking very much with the information that um, I have access to when it comes to the NGO forum. Um, and so it's unfortunate. Well, wow, that's a drop in the earth. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, 7 million, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, agreed. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, thank you, Marwa. So shall we just look at this sample? Sure. Uh, yes. That will, will try to show us this, uh, the gap in, in funding. Uh, just wanted to note that actually the figures are slightly bigger. The gap is slightly bigger because there's some new organization who filled the survey later today and we, they're not reflected in these, uh, in these graphs. But the numbers are relatively enough to give you the picture of how, you, how huge is the gap in funding. Um, okay, go ahead, Marwa. Okay. Well, as you can see, I think it's self-explanatory. Um, so as Fatma mentioned, is so with um, how, how many are, is this the collection of now? Is Two it over? Million. Hmm? 42 million is uh, received. By how many organizations, sorry, was it? Uh, because 30, 38 or 39? This, this is was based on 38 organizations. Huh. By today or by now, we have 42 organizations who have filled. So the figures oh. are slightly, like slightly different. But I hope this is enough to give us a yeah. clear picture of how how big is the gap. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Please. So thank you very much, Fatma. Yeah. So as you can see, we're talking about you know 40 organizations approximately that have received 41 million. Now. Let us keep in mind so far that this was not from the help of the UN agencies. So this funding by the 40 has come from different sources. Um, and so this is all that's been received in a span of six weeks, which again, when you are talking about this disaster, 40 million, when the funding that's required just for this period, by the way, we're not talking about the overall upcoming year. No, we're talking about for the period of 90 days. You know, the funding that's required is approximately 300 million and only 40 has come through. And nothing okay. from you. Again, very, very, very little. It doesn't even count. Yeah, exactly from the UN. So. Yeah. Oh, and the, the the organizations that were taken as a sample are the largest national NGOs, by the way. So this, this tells you something, you know, that definitely not enough is being put. Um, here are more. These are about the beneficiaries. Um, of course, as you can see, the total number is quite big um, of the target beneficiaries. We're happy, of course, to share these numbers later. So the funding that's required to support all of these sectors. So again, we just took random sectors. We didn't go through all of the sectors. However, we just took the main sectors. And as you see, the funding that's required, yeah, the 300 million. The breakdown, as you see, again, mostly it's food, the need for food, um, education, yeah, water, yeah. The amount that's received, as you can see, mm -hmm. the food, again. And the gap, it's just huge. It's absolutely huge. And the fact that, you know, donors are repeatedly saying how, you know, how devastating this crisis is, and they're all supporting, you know, bringing Syria back onto the map and supporting what has happened in Turkey and ensuring that Turkey returns to, you know, the, the strong country that it once was, and to make sure that the Syrians, you know, are not, you know, affected even worse than they were before. This is really sad that we're still in need of the 300 million. You know, it's it's really it's really really sad. And 
as we know that when we are looking at, you know, food, you know, this is the number one, you know, need. So now all the donors that are, you know, supporting or that are donating, unfortunately, have, and fortunate, let's say both, fortunately and unfortunately, have given towards food, but ignored very much so the other sectors. Uh, let us keep in mind that during this time, and we've seen it here in Turkey, it's exactly the same in Syria. The first thing that happens, you know, and it's happened to my colleagues, and I'm sure to your colleagues as well. And Ahmed, you've seen it with your own eyes when you visited Janderas, when you were in Hatay, you know, that the first thing that happened is that people ran, ran with whatever they were wearing. They fled their homes like this. So they have nothing, absolutely nothing. And what do people need to survive with? Food and water. Then comes shelter. Then comes everything else. But unfortunately, even that cannot be covered by donors. Yeah. So we have the response strategy. Um, the coalition, uh, during its meetings, have met to discuss what has happened in this 45 days, what has been achieved in this 45 days, what has been discussed in this 45 days, and what are the needs in the 45 days. We have all experienced all this. I, suppose I don't need to read through this. We have all experienced this. 45 days is over. Now we need to start looking at the next 90 days. And in the next 90 days, it's not just about emergency needs. It's about the emergency as well as the recovery needs. Because we cannot create a disaster out of a disaster. We know that with this disaster, the need for emergency response is very high. The need to provide food and water and a home and a shelter and somewhere safe is there. However, if we cannot also simultaneously support education, health, economic recovery, economic empowerment, fixing of the infrastructure, the rehabilitation of roads, we have caused another disaster. For example, if we do, if we deny the need for these other sectors and the need to support education, we have a huge disaster of high dropout rate, which we know what will happen when that uh, is a result. Of course, then all social crimes and ills will happen, will result of that. And you do not want a generation of ignorance, you know? If there is no uh, support for hospitals, for repairs of hospitals, where will the people go in need of health support and health care? When there is no building and rehabilitation of roads, how can commute work? How, how will people be able to get from one place to the next? It doesn't happen. If there's no rehabilitation of markets, if there's no rehabilitation and provision of small business grants to get people started up again, how will they work? How will they earn a living? So if we just focus on emergency needs, we will cause a huge disaster on top of a disaster. So we need to make sure that in the next 90 days that we are pushing for both simultaneously, emergency as well as rehabilitation. On top of that, the support for supporting governance and community management, because we cannot and we should not think that leaving people to be is the way to go forward. Because the day that you have every individual focusing on what they can do for themselves means that it's the big fish eating the small fish, which then we will go back to Darwinism, which we do not want, of course. This is a community disaster. We need to manage it as a community. We need to make sure that the community works together. We need to make sure that there is governance in place. We need to make sure that the engagement and empowerment is given 
to the communities. So in the next 90 days, this is the plan. This is what we need to advocate for. This is what we need to push for. And this is what we need funding for. So I will stop there. And if anyone has any questions, comments, or we can open the floor to directly now discussing what is the way forward. Uh, I want to highlight one point. Uh, uh, my colleagues will be on field tomorrow, so they need to uh, go uh, leave this uh, meeting early. Uh, if it's possible, uh, can we give a word to Ahmed Ceylan first? Okay. Yes. So the, uh, my question to uh, 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 Sister Mara, um, uh, does, does this mean that uh, we don't need uh, any fund for health, nutrition, shelter? And so, uh, but this is this is what I said. I said that we must we must do it simultaneously, emergency as well as this recovery and rehabilitation because if we don't rehabilitate the hospitals yeah, this is right this is a disaster yani when where do people go who have been injured who are I sick agree. yeah nutrition again yeah baby so people are still still living in in tents yes so they don't have containers so we need shelter and we need uh, healthcare. Uh, those who are living in in the in the in the camps. So we need nutrition. We need uh, funds yes. for the healthcare. Uh, so as I said, the needs in the field is limitless. Exactly. Uh, as Brother Honey said, they are already in a, in in a war for for more yes. more than ten years. The the buildings was already uh, damaged by the <laughs> you know, rockets. Exactly. So, so that the, the, the earthquake really increased, they changed everything. And you said they they uh, they got security from Turkey. Uh, they uh, find a place to stay, but uh, again by the earthquake, they changed the the things really. Exactly. Uh, yeah, agreed. I agree. I I agree with you. Uh, it, 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 in in Gindares, that may explain my uh, my observation. Uh, we are uh, we have a, uh, a primary healthcare uh, services in Jindres in, in Mohammedia and uh, Deir Balutka. Uh, there, uh, more than ten thousand people are living. So the the, the 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 number of people living in this camp. Uh, by the way, this camp established uh, to, in two thousand eighteen. Okay. Uh, by the, the number of people uh, living in this camp increased because people stayed homeless. So the buildings has collapsed. So day by day, the, 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 this number is you know changing, you know, increasing. So they, they, I observed that they are uh, some, some new camps established. For example, there are some uh, NGOs from uh, Gulf countries establishing new camps. Uh, just just behind behind us, uh, I, I guess uh, he, the 600 uh, camps, new camps established. So they 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 don't have hygiene. They don't have. Uh, they need healthcare. They need food. So uh, the 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 the, uh, the em em emergency uh, phase is not finished. This is what I am saying. So as you said, this should be uh, simultaneously. So the first phase and the second phase should be simultaneous. Uh, now uh, the burden uh, of uh, our, uh, the burden we have in our, in, in, in our health center in the camp uh, increased because uh, for example, in, in the past, the previous uh, 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 to earthquake we had they the a hundred beneficiaries now more than two hundred. So what we need is uh, extra doctors in the camp. What we need is PSA services, uh, they, because they need psychosocial support. Uh, I didn't see any playground for the children uh, in, in, in Jinderes, in Afrin, and in Aziz. 
I visited all those areas. We need uh, uh, playground for uh, playground for the children. Uh, the boys uh, somehow they can play, but uh, especially give the, the, for the girls, uh, the things are uh, much more difficult. Uh, this is my uh, observation. Uh, the, the conditions in the camp is not hygienic. Uh, in, in, in just uh, near the camp, there is a river, affluent river. Uh, the river is not clean, but the people, the, the children is inside the river are playing. So uh, we need uh, pro uh, protective uh, also uh, health uh, activities uh, besides uh, yeah, uh, how can therapeutic uh, services. So this should be again simultaneously. We should, uh, uh, I don't know, we should talk with the local imams, local sheikhs. Uh, they should uh, uh, raise the awareness about hygiene. Uh, we could have some brochures in the camp, you know, in the, we can have a, uh, relation with the local uh, local assemblies in, in, in the fields. They could, you know, distribute uh, some brochures. Uh, they can talk with the teachers, hojas, sheikhs, the, the local leaders. They are key for me. And we, I think we lack this because UN, as I said, is not uh, uh, including them, include, in, including uh, locals because they have strict rules and procedures. They are insisting you to have this, to have that. Uh, they need logical frame or lo logical frame uh, for a project to get to receive funds. And they don't know. They don't have such, uh, you know, understanding. Uh, they what they, what they think is they should act. They are acting, by the way, uh, more than the INGOs. More than INGOs. This is my observation. So people need now hygienic, hygiene-related uh, awareness activities. Uh, in, in the camps, uh, as I said, uh, many, many state homeless, we need to raise uh, funds for the health, health care. Yes. And we should have, uh, we should have PSS, PSS and MHPSS services. And the thing is, for example, SRD was uh, giving their uh, maternity services but the, the building, they have collapsed. Now they are in, in, in a tent. Uh, uh, so this is the crucial. And as Dr. Sotva Turkey, we are the only organization in the camp, by the way, serving uh, more than 15,000 people. So our plan is to increase our capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we are planning to put uh, uh, PSS services. We, are, we, are, uh, we will have a playground uh, for for the children, we will uh, hire uh, one more practitioner. We will have a case worker, uh, and we, we have to update our stock, medicine stock, because the demand is high. The demand is high. The need is high, and we should also focus on abortion related programs, projects, and programs. This is the part of health. The given primary health care is not enough. Uh, nutrition is not, they, uh, they complement each other. You have to have uh, protective and uh, therapeutic services both simultaneously. Uh, this is my observation and uh, our action plan. Thank you very much. For all, if you have any question, I am pleased to answer. I think Dr. Henny had his hand up first and then I'll ask after him. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, let me see if I'm, no. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think your frustration, uh, Sister Maru, and everyone in the room about the lack of financial support from UN, it reflects uh, the donor uh, attitude and the donor direction uh, at the moment from Europe and America, which is totally to Ukraine. And this is something actually we have been uh, discussing it a few months ago when we started to organize the forthcoming conference for Syria at the end of this year. We mentioned this many times to people that there will be lack of funding for the existing humanitarian situation of Syria uh, in West Africa, 
uh, which including Somalia, Ethiopia, and other countries, and South Sudan, and Tanzania, and Sudan itself, and uh, uh, lack of funding to Yemen as well, because of the war in Ukraine. A, recently, a recent meeting was held, uh, I'm not sure if Munawara has attended this or not, in London by the concerned department, and they have not promised anything for Syria and Turkey. This was nearly three, four weeks ago. That's why your frustration comes from the UN is a uh, government organization, and there's nothing on the table. I would love to see what's happening next week in Brussels, actually, the, the, the pledging conference. And it might be another joke, actually, if they'll be able to uh, put on the table $500 million or less, and how much of them would be materialized. Now, Europe and America, to be very honest, are not interested in Turkey, not interested in Afghanistan, not interested in all these disasters, or Syria and others, whether it's acute, as in the earthquake, or in the chronic, which actually uh, happened before. So I think, uh, Brother uh, Ahmed and everybody, as you have seen, that these 41 or 42 organizations have raised so far, maybe for the other three on top of them, maybe 50, 55 million uh, dollar or euro. And that's it. Uh, maybe somebody else have been raising some more money, but this will be what is going to be tangible in your hand, unfortunately. Because of the Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, for everyone, and you know better than myself, could be changing into either nuclear war or to a third world war, unfortunately. And we hope that this will not happen. That's why uh, Europe and America are on their feet and have a, have a knee-jerk effect of how to stop this war. And they're spending billions which might need to become, might become trillion of dollars on this war. Thank you. Yes, I totally agree with you, um, Dr. Henny, on that. And actually, um, as you know, the controversy about the, the meeting in Brussels, which is on the 20th, right, on Monday, um, the pledge conference, eh, I'm not sure if everyone's aware that there is no Syria representation. That's another one. So that already shows us from now uh, that it's probably going to be another joke. Yeah, of a conference. Um, I I would like to also add, yes, of course, yes, Dr. Henny, you're so right, because still Syria, uh, you know, let's say because of the past or the 12th year that we're in to the war is Syria prior to the earthquake uh, was at the verge of being stopped with regards to funding. Mm. With this earthquake, it has brought it somewhat back onto the agenda. Okay, just because of the earthquake, just because of the earthquake, nothing else. So once this earthquake passes and the hype passes, that means basically that we will go back to struggling, advocating, begging, you know, for support of a country that's been destroyed, not once from the war, but twice with the earthquake. So uh, my also comment to you, Ahmed, is yes, Totally agreed. As, as we mentioned in our funding asks here, the psychological support and protection interventions. So uh, I can wear now my TAS hat, my Tekevelishim hat. We um, have a large protection uh, program in which we are actually working both in Turkey and in Syria for um, in general, but then now with the earthquake response, we are um, supporting children in all of our schools. We are supporting, actually, to give you just a quick brief, TAS supports 30% of all schools in Northwest Syria. Okay, so in all of our education projects, we have a full component of protection, full. So it is actually embedded. 
And so basically we are covering the protection aspects of that. Now, due to this earthquake response also, with an additional project that we have as TAS, what we are doing is that we are providing play areas, recreational um, areas for the kids. We are setting up tents for recreational activities and slash, you know, protection activities, you know? So with kids, of course, you know, we have our sports therapy, we have our art therapy, we have the different types of therapy. I'm not technical, so I'll leave that to our technical people. Um, and so this does exist. We have in the markets, prior to the earthquake, of course, we always included, we established markets. So we always have a play area for the children, you know, and of course, for disability friendly purposes also, we ensure that, you know, things are disabled friendly. Um, additionally, what we are trying to do now is uh, we have a campaign in which we are supporting um, how many camps? I can't remember how many camps at the moment now across Northwest Syria um, with gifts for the children. And we are providing support, psychosocial support on an individual as well as group sessions. So we are trying to engage in a lot of protection activities because as, as mentioned earlier, and as you also mentioned, that the mental health is, is a huge problem, you know, and it needs to be supported. Nutrition, yes, we are um, as tasked, but also I know all of the other partners as well are trying to ensure that nutrition is covered because we are still dealing with lactating mothers. We're still dealing with pregnant women. We're still dealing with babies. We're still dealing with children. We're still dealing with all this. So uh, what's happening is that in, in the food uh, food distributions. I know that they're also distributing, is it BSF, BFS, BSF, for you, the nutrition component. Uh, which parts of Northwest Syria are we working? In all parts. <laughs> so we have, we have um, across um, Western Aleppo and Idlib. We are throughout, yeah. So we do have, you have any, any, any uh, activities in Jin that is in Afrin, in Gaza? Yes, Aziz? yes. We have even the, we, we established our uh, soup kitchens throughout Janderes, Afrin, Azez, all over. Actually, our headquarters started in Azez. Actually, we I, have. I, I, I will visit. I will have a visit yes. on, on, on Monday. I will yes, make yes. a mini. <laughs> well, ah, super. Wallahi, seriously, you can reach out to me, Wallahi, and I will even have the team I'll there just as host you. you. Wallahi, okay. I'll have the team host you. And you okay, can join uh, some of our food distribution. Okay, I, I will visit them. We Come can on. talk. What can we do together? Uh, we will be in coordination with them. Sure, sure. I will at least. Yes. Great. Great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like we're we're happy to help. We would love to cooperate. Yeah, absolutely. Like if there's anything that we could help as much as possible, you know, this is what all of our aim is, right? At the end of the day. And re with regards, Ahmed, to the hygiene. So in fact, in our wash program, we are doing the hygiene promotion, as you know, awareness, you know, through the hygiene kits and then that. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you, Sufyan. Yeah. I'm sure we will catch up another time, definitely. But yeah, so as you see, there's a huge need. And as you mentioned, Ahmed, like, you know, one, two, 10, 15 organizations isn't enough. Yeah, it needs to be across the board. And without having proper funding, you know, allocated to the various emergency and recovery activities, it makes no sense because then we're gonna be going for back to square one in when the time of the, the actual war started. And we can't do that, you know? Shelters, we can't keep putting people back into camps and tents, you know? We, we got over that two years ago, remember when there was a shift into dignified shelter settlements? Now everything's back to being destroyed again. So putting the people back into tents and camps, this is lack of dignity. It's not dignified. And so we need to push for dignified shelters. 
and and solutions. Yeah, so I agree with you totally. And you know, the health is number one. Yani, you can't without it. It's a it's it's a problem. <laughs> you know. So okay, yeah. So the way forward then, are we going to continue advocating? The thing is, the I I, I I what I believe is we have enough funds, but the half funds are uh, used effectively is the the question mark for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So we uh, the I, I, NGOs and I, I NGOs are uh, in search of ten percent of admin cost. Okay, so the 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 action is not based on the the, the need in the field, but the, how they can profit. Uh, the, the NGO sector, in my opinion, is a kind of a, a sector that people are making pro, pro, profit out of it. Okay, if you have a sincere uh, intention, you can do a lot. Even for, uh, for example, two hundred thousand uh, dollars, that, that this would be enough for you to fund to have a you know one year of. Uh, health center giving MHPSS primary health care services to uh, for let me say uh, 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. Imagine it. So this is uh, my uh, idea, my uh, thought mm -hmm. about uh, the fund and how they, the funds are uh, used uh, in an in, in an effective way. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll I'll respond to you, Ahmed, on that point. In a second, let's just um, see Abdul Hamid. Yes, Abdul Hamid. Uh, thank you for for the for the presentation and uh, for all your uh, contributions, Abdul Hamid from um, You know, very very valid points have been raised by everyone. Um, the the disaster that we've witnessed is a disaster on top of a disaster. Um, you know, pre earthquake uh, Syria has only been made worse. Um, and the need is much, much uh, bigger than what it was. And this is a, a responsibility on all of us. Let's not talk about the UN sector and social donors. It's a responsibility of us as NGOs uh, to think long-term, not think short-term. At the moment, we're very reactive. We respond when there's an earthquake, we respond when there's flooding, uh, we respond when there's, you know, little, little bits and bobs. It's, it's easy to fundraise, it's easy to market, uh, and it's easy to buy these food packs, et cetera, and distribute. We need to think more long term. We need to push the agenda to uh, uh, providing longer term. Uh, one thing that Islamic Khalifa are doing, and many other NGOs are doing, is permanent solutions. And this is, you know, a fantastic project. You know, moving people from you know, a decade where a long uh, living tent to more permanent structures, a roof over their head, you know, proper proper uh, uh, infrastructure work, you know, wash facilities, you know, this, this, this is, you know, this is giving people the dignified support that is, is a responsibility uh, on all of us and we will be accountable for this. Um, this, is, this is how we uh, spend our money uh, much more effectively as NGOs. Um, yes, we, we still need to respond to these small emergencies that do occur. But as NGOs, you know, even in terms of our wash, our wash sector response, um, you know, providing water children, yes, it's short term, but why not look, uh, look at uh, longer term pro programs, rehabilitating existing water sources that need, you know, cleaning, that need pipe work, that need sort of solar panel uh, uh, powered uh, system. You know, these are the kind of long-term solutions as NGOs we need to look into. Um, so yeah, this is just my contribution uh, from my side. And yeah, thank you all for, for, for sharing all this very useful information. Thank, thank you, Abdul Hamid. Um, and yes, I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I can give you an example of um, uh, the organization I'm at. So at TAS, uh, again, something that Dr. Henny mentioned at the very, very, very beginning, a few hours ago, uh, is that, you know, the donor mentality. So, uh, for example, yes, we also have, you know, the the dignified shelter solutions. We do also have the long-term wash 
uh, solutions in which we're actually using rainwater harvesting and solar irrigation and all of this. We, we do have that project and even it, the project that we have eliminates completely water trucking. And even it was shared with the global cluster, the wash cluster, et cetera, et cetera, and they were all fascinated by it. But the issue now is we are facing a situation where the donor mentality is what needs to be changed now, because again, not every donor is accepting of these types of solutions. Their mentality is still, we are fighting it that it's not to be imposed on us that you want this money to go to food. Well, guess what? There's already enough food on the ground. Uh, I was even mentioning much earlier, Abdul Hamid, that you know, some of my meal team come back and they're like, Marwa, make sure that the donors don't support any more blankets. There are already families with two and three blankets, you know, which, you know, this is a waste of money. And I have spoken very openly with many of the donors, both with my TAS hat, as well as my NGO forum hat, and said that a disaster an emergency working in this context, we cannot be ticking boxes. And donors now are just ticking boxes for the sake of I've got funds, send it out in the easiest way possible, just to tick the box of I did it. I spent the money. And this is not healthy. Yeah. If, if I can just add, Maru, yeah, and I'm, you know, you spot on. Um, it's not just a case of uh, thinking long term and implementing. We see a lot of good uh, uh, projects, but in terms of the quality of the projects as well, there's no, there's no point in implementing long term projects with very low quality uh, outputs. Uh, this is a waste of resources as well. So, as organizations, NGOs, we really need to look into the quality aspect of things. Uh, invest in, in better quality for longer durable, durable solutions. Uh, not just short-term quick fixes, tick boxing, media related uh, interventions. Uh, so yeah, absolutely with you on this one. Absolutely agreed, agreed. And this takes me back to the point about um, localization in particular, which is another issue I know we're going to have to deal with at a later stage. However, you know, fighting with donors and convincing them that support is required in regards to certain budget lines, you know, that you need to ensure the quality is there. Therefore, how does quality become achieved through the, the, the types of inputs that are put in, the capacity you know, the, the policies, procedures, SOPs, all the things that make up a high quality with high standard project output in which this can be really long-term and long-lasting and engaging the community and making sure that they are empowered. So when we are no longer around, that is still functioning and they are dealing with it on their own, you know? and try to ask donors for additional funds for certain budget lines. We were even suffering from convincing them to give us a 10% overhead, you know? Or if we're asking for duty of care, or if we're asking for any additionals, they're like, oh, just cut it out of your overhead. So we literally won't have any overhead after that, right? Yes, Abba Hamid. Yeah, and spot on. I think what's happening in the sector is we're all competing with each other. We're, try, we're all trying to undercut each other, and that's at the uh, the cost of the quality uh, which is uh, being brought to the to these communities. I mean, one thing we're doing at Islamic Relief is okay, we're building uh, permanent shelters, but it's not just the shelters that need to be there. You need to have the the relevant infrastructure, the the, the uh, sewage networks, you know, connecting people to you know these basic uh, amenities that where where we we take advantage for for advantage here. Uh, so these, these are the kind of uh, long-term solutions we, we, we need to look at. Stop competing with each other, uh, work with each other rather than undercutting each other. And this is a, you know, a message to all our fundraising departments in, in, in all NGOs. And this is something yes. that we need to we need to do more of. You know, Agreed. we will only change the donor uh, mindset when we're all working towards the same goal. At the moment, it's not the case. I agree. Spot on. Thank you. Spot on. Thank you, yeah. you Abdul Hamid. Thank you, Marwa. Um, 
uh, yesterday we had exactly the same version of, uh, of this meeting, but in Arabic. It was attended by about 20 organizations. And there were a few points that came out from that meeting as a way forward. Uh, Dr. Hanil Benna, would you like to summarize the main points that came from yesterday's meeting, which I feel so far are very similar to what we are discussing at the moment? I think, okay, just one second. Uh, I took down your notes, yeah. Dr. Henny. Yeah, I okay. mentioned them to you before, Sister Marwa. Mm -hmm. If you want me, ah, if you want me to talk about them or you talk yes. about them. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, uh, uh, because of the, the uh, variation of the organization who filled the form, actually, sometime we need to revisit the form again uh, and uh, make more analysis, detailed analysis. Uh, as you said, all of you, the data that you are having, including UN data, is not accurate. Actually, this is actually mentioned yesterday. Uh, another comment was talking about different geographical needs in different locations inside Syria, even inside Turkey. Uh, number four, uh, with the time, as Abd Hamid said, that we unite together not only to make policies, but actually to start investing in research, research and collecting the proper statistical data. Uh, number four is actually the role of the volunteering groups inside Syria, which has been neglected by many of the organizations, and we should invest in them, make them a part of the current organization working inside Syria, uh, because these uh, volunteering groups are should be considered one of the first responder, actually, to give us the exact need of the local community. Uh, number five is actually, which has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Abdurrahman in the meeting on the 18th, I mentioned also by, by, by Dima yesterday, about the waste. The waste uh, because of the lack of resources and because of what uh, Abdurrahman said that we're trying to cut the throat of one another, actually. And we have to find a new way of coordination and, and networking. We cannot you keep using the same old system and thinking that we're going to succeed in coordinating things. Number six or seven is the donor culture. And donor here could be the Arab stroke Muslim donor or the international donors, the non-Muslims. Because this kind of top-down approach is not acceptable anymore, but this cannot be done on this, as Abdulhamid said, we, we stand up together actually to say no for this kind of funding uh, to the local community. Uh, uh, we talk, they talked again about, uh, what else? About the strategy. Who should be making the strategy if we don't involve the local community? Without local community, it's not a strategy anymore. It is just a rhetoric discussion in our headquarters, unfortunately. Uh, who is going to put the priority? You see, we talked about priority, 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 priority. Who is going to make it? Is it UN, top-down approach? It's international organization, top-down approach, or local co community, bottom-up uh, approach with us as well? Uh, talk about governance and the lack of governance and uh, the need for building the local uh, organizations, which has come back, as uh, Sister Marwa was talking about, the, the localization, investing in localization, which was one of the recommendations came from 2016 in the uh, World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul. Up till now, unfortunately, is not practically applied. It was mentioned that 25 per 23 to 30% should be given directly to the local organization, but it's not happening. What we have seen at the moment, it should not be less than 50% funding given to the local organization, uh, not only 25%. Uh, we concluded yesterday by a statement uh, from uh, brother, two statements. One of them is saying that we don't take any admin cost. Nobody can work without admin cost. No one. 
whether you are local or international. And this is something we need to educate, particularly the Arab donors and Muslim donors, that actually 0% admin is not acceptable. You give me 1% to implement a project or 2%, it's not acceptable, actually. And moving from this, we have to be paid because there's no work without payment. Uh, no effective work without payment. No actually community change without payment to the staff who are going to make the uh, change in the community. Uh, the last comment, which was very painful by Hassan, uh, uh, our, our, before the last, who's going to put the strategy? I mentioned it before. And last comment by Hassan, that actually we became uh, very good implementing agencies and moved to become very good uh, contractors. And I added to this, we made also our local community in Syria to become a very professional, bigger because we created or we supported the dependency syndrome, which has been created by the donor culture, which has been imposed on all the local organization. And we changed the highly, especially in the case of, uh, of Syria, the highly motivated uh, uh, working classes uh, on the side of the Syria into beggars, unfortunately. Now they're sitting in rooms and they're just waiting for the food basket and don't have any initiative. This is what came yeah, for, 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 from yesterday's discussion. Back to you, Fatima. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Uh, we have less than 20 minutes uh, to the end of this meeting. Um, you know, the floor is open for you. If you have any other feedback, comments, um, you'd like to say anything, please go ahead. I think today's meeting also was very similar to yesterday's. The outputs seem the same. So I think we can definitely, the way forward is to definitely focus more on, you know, making sure we have proper data, um, making sure that we have a common strategy, uh, definitely making sure that we are not just focusing on emergency. So we don't push for that, you know, the agenda of making everybody dependent on emergency aid. Um, and becoming beggars. Uh, I def okay. um, definitely short term and long term quality, changing the mindsets of donors. Yeah, I think we're definitely on the same page with um, those issues. Uh, proper allocation towards all sectors and not just specific ones. Yes. Um, yeah, I think we're on the same page for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marwa. Uh, yes, yesterday meeting was attended by, by roughly 30 organizations, um, and local organizations, national and international, uh, and it was in Arabic. Um, so yes, I, I believe that we are all on the same page. We all can see this gap and we all are looking forward to, to to manage to put um, a map for actions and for commitments. And as you said, Marwa, earlier, the disaster is so huge that no one organization can just do everything. We have to come together and work together uh, to, to try to at least, at least, you know, alleviate some of the challenges that our brothers and sisters are facing in Syria and in Turkey. Uh, okay, then if there is nothing else to, uh, to add, Maybe we are gonna conclude the meeting here. Um, yeah, so last chance if anyone wants to like to add or to say anything. Uh, if not, then I want to thank you again for attending this meeting. And as I said before, we will resend these statements. So the, the, and the survey, this, the door still open for your contribution and for sharing it amongst your contacts. And we will keep updating you with, uh, you know, whatever, whatever next step we will be doing in, through our commitments to, to action uh, as a response to this earthquake and the Syrian uh, humanitarian cause in general. Okay, so thank you again. I will end the meeting now.
Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care.